Hello, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Carl Wetzel, and I'm excited to introduce you to our speakers. Captain Donald E. Peacock is a captain on the tall ship Lynx, hailing from Nantucket. The Lynx is an interpretation of a War of 1812 privateer. Donald shares command of the Lynx with his son, Captain Alex Peacock of Newmarket, New Hampshire, in Bermuda. Donald, with Alex, make a fifth and sixth generation of traditional sailors with documented service dating back to 1832 with Rear Admiral George Foster Emmons. Peacock will spend his 64th summer on Nantucket aboard Lynx in the harbor. Donald lives in New Hampshire with his wife Nancy of 40 years and Skipper, their dog, when not sailing in various ports on the East Coast, lecturing and hosting maritime sailing experiences. American troubadour Bill Schustick has spent a life weaving American legend and song into the fabric of history. His performances have ranged from the windswept decks of tall ships to countless musical and concert theaters across the country and on to command performances at the White House from intimate gatherings in almost every, in almost every sacred historical setting to literally millions at a seventh game of the World Series. Troubadour Schustick has authored two full-length ballets many television and theatrical productions, including the musical On Shiloh Hill, produced by Ford's Theater. Throughout Bill's long, traveled career, as the so many people on the island will attest, his inspirational home has always been here on the island of Nantucket. I'll turn it over now to Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. This uh, period that we're talking about is referred to by historians as the American heroic age. And that's not just American historians. And we did not have a flag function song back then. And then Joseph Hopkinson comes up with a song in 1798 that swept the country in a couple days up and down the coast. Everybody was singing it. It captured the, our spirit of the time. It goes like this. Hail Columbia, happy land. Hail ye heroes, heaven-born band, who fought and bled in freedom's cause, who fought and bled in freedom's cause. And when the storm of war was o'er, enjoyed the peace their valor won. Let Independence be our boast, ever mindful of the cost, ever grateful for the prize. May her altar reach the skies, and everybody would join in. Firm, united, let us be, rallying round our liberty as a band of brothers joined. Peace and safety we shall find. Peace and safety we shall find. Interesting. Okay, here we go. Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the War of 1812 via the Revolutionary War. Um, delighted to be here and take you through a voyage of two islands. Our two islands are Northern Island, Nantucket, and our Southern Island, St. Simons Island, Georgia, which both play tremendous inspiration and significance in America's ability to re to gain our independence and freedom. Through a very storied time of over 40 years, it took to do that. It was a very patriotic movement by some very, very determined people in very tough circumstances that made exceptional young America exceptional through this uh, time. We have two very significant places. Nantucket is a place of neutrality with no love for Nantucket from America and no love for Nantucket from England. And as Badinsky writes in Perilous Fight, on October 11th, 1814, the hardest fought naval engagement of the entire war took place off of Nantucket between the privateer Prince de Neuchâtel and the five barges from the British frigate Endemion. 
the hardest fought naval engagement of the entire war? Well, let's get there. Let's enjoy this evening together and find out what happens. We start with William Roach. William Roach really made a name for themselves in Nantucket as a, a whaling and a merchant family. They owned many ships, merchant ships that were sailing primarily uh, transatlantic. Uh, they had some small coasters uh, serving between the islands and the mainland, and they had their whaling ships. And at the time, where Atlantic whaling was the majority of it, but we're beginning to stretch our legs a little bit into the Pacific and into the ice. Nantucket has largely been responsible for whaling out the Atlantic, and now we're gonna search for further hunting grounds far, far away. These voyages are gonna last three to five years, a tremendous amount of time. If you're a wash ashore standing on Nantucket Beach and you get on a whale ship, well, chances are your first stop after you've been hired on as a crew is to the ship's store. You're gonna be provided with uh, credit for clothing, shoes for your voyage. But nonetheless, when you get back from a three to five year voyage, there's a good chance that you won't have enough money to pay back that ship's store. As a wash ashore, you're not a Nantucket family member. Nantucket families became very wealthy during this period, this time. And the wash ashores that couldn't pay back their debt to the ship store from three to five years earlier are bound for dentured certitude for the next voyage. The Roach family down on the bottom of Main Street with the counting house, the Pacific Club, so to speak, is uh, still there today. Next. And the um, above that door of the Pacific Club are three very significant ships in America's history, but also Nantucket's history. The Bar Dartmouth and the Beaver and the Bedford. Now the Dartmouth and the Beaver merchant vessels have just gone across to England to deliver whaling products, the oil, the baleen for women's hoop dresses, other products, everything from the whale is rendered. They've come to England to sell their wares. England is whaling products biggest customer. And Nantucket is their biggest source for their goods. The Dartmouth and the Beaver sail one way and they always look for a reverse cargo, whether that be from France or from England. And they're lucky enough to board England with a lot of tea. One of the things that is a problem with young America is you've got dual taxation without representation. You're paying for your tea duty in England and you bring it back in the governor of New York the uh, lead of the Massachusetts Bay Colony wants his take of the tea tax too. So as a Dartmouth and the Beaver arrive back in Boston, they sit in the harbor to settle out this tea controversy. Dartmouth and Beaver finally make their way in and they play their part in history here again. Here it is folks, Two ships from Nantucket are the highlight and in the limelight of the Boston Tea Party. This is a protest under England's tyranny and taxation on young America. But this is not the only time that William Roach has become significant in international uh, maritime opportunities. In 1773, we have the Tea Party. In 1776, we have Roach, still an active whaleman and merchant. But we get into the uh, 1785, that sailing vessel, the Beaver. The Beaver, pardon me, the Bedford. The Bedford is a st first ship merchant vessel to sail those rebel colors in London town. Roach's Bedford sails into London with American goods under the colors of the Stars and Stripes. This is 1785, the first time the Stars and Stripes have e ever entered the harbor. We advance a little bit in the story here to come up with another international Nantucket uh, occasion. Next. And we come up with the Essex. Well, we all know that Nathaniel Philbrick in the Heart of the Sea, our good friend and Nantucket author, 
memorialized the Essex and the hardship of the men in the heart of the sea. And Melville had referred to Nantucket as that small sand spit in the sea. And Melville wrote about the demise of the Essex and the Moby Dick is the great novel that Melville did based upon the ramming of the whale from the Essex. Next. As a young kid growing up in Sudbury and fortunate enough to spend summers on Nantucket, the Revolutionary War is embedded in us. Sudbury, not far from the Lincoln and Lexington and Concord town green, where the shot around the world was fired. Sudbury sent more men into the militia for the Revolutionary War than any other town did. Thus, Sudbury was awarded the zip code 01776. The Minutemen were right there by the minute. They were plowing, plowing their fields. They'd hear the sound of a gun or a horseback, horsebackman riding by, giving, sounding the alarm, the warning. They would drop their plow. They'd run to the barn. They'd grab their weapons and they'd go to their congregating spot and get their orders as a fighting militia, really guerrilla warfare against the Redcoats. Sudbury has a long history of wonderful um, uh, militia activities, even up to this day. The 1776 has an awful lot of impact in our world today. The 21 gun salute for the president. Where do you get the 21 gun salute? Well, 21, you add 1776, 21. At the Tomb of the Unknown, the guards take 21 steps. As we move along from our Revolutionary War impact, we're going to take you through the story now where President, actually General Washington, in the Revolutionary War, General Washington finds himself down at Yorktown. Cornwallis is well fortified. Washington has had some wins, some gains heavy losses, but Washington now has the tremendous benefit of realizing what a Navy is. He doesn't have a Navy, but through Franklin and Washington negotiations, the French Navy showed up at Yorktown. Washington defeats Cornwallis. Cornwallis capitulates. Cornwallis retreats. And at this point, we have won the Revolutionary War. We are now a sovereign nation of United States, and Washington goes on to be our very first president. Could have been a king, but he rejected the re-entry. Washington knew the benefit of the Navy because if it weren't for the French showing up, it would have been uh, probably a much different story written by of the Revolutionary War. We probably would not have been the United States. We probably would have remained colonies. That was ex actually the goal for um, England to begin with. Washington and Jefferson lobbied for many years to get a Navy. After eight years of negotiations, finally Congress approves the money to build the six frigates. As we now sail down to our sister southern island, the island of St. Simons Island, Georgia, with these wonderful, beautiful live oak. This live oak is virtually impenetrable and the story that I'm about to outline will astound you with what young America did to conceive of such a incredible opportunity with a, their technology of wood and their um, uh, ability to build. It was said that the men that were sent to cut down the live oak in Georgia would have rather gone to battle because it was so difficult to harvest this. It was heavy, there were a lot of insects, there was marshes, there was um, mud, there was weight, tremendous weight. Uh, you have to work the live oak like iron. It dulls your tools. You could virtually lay out the components of a ship on a standing tree. You see these live oaks, like this one in St. Simons, they grow like large bushes. Some of these branches stick out 60, 70 feet long. A gentleman down there two weeks ago was explaining when they were kids, they would go from branch to branch to the village down to where the king and prince are now without even stepping on the ground. That is how thickly and, in, and entangled these trees would get. And you can only imagine what it must have been like when there was no management or development down there. It was a very difficult process. Next. 
This live oak was harvested and actually uh, brought out of St. Simons right here. This is showing our beautiful schooner, privateer Lynx, and this is now 240 years later of the causeway. Live oak was being harvested in 1794, and this causeway was built in the 70s. The causeway on the lower left empties right out onto Gascoigne Point, a park, Gascoigne Bluff. And right where Lynx is now, 240 years ago, would have been the cargo ships lined up to take this live oak all the way to Boston, Philadelphia, and Portsmouth, New Hampshire for the construction of the six frigates. The uh, live oak was essentially could be considered a technological advance in ship design and building because nobody had built ships out of it before, but we knew the strength of it and the uh, technology or the product was really kept as secret as stealth technology is today. It was really something as we'll learn further on into our um, story. Next, please. Here we are, the oldest warship in the world commissioned USS Constitution launched in 1797. This is an amazing vessel. She was captained by amazing captains. It was said that Constitution never engaged with an equal force, either two or more vessels to engage Constitution. Do you know that Constitution was so well mustered daily for firing that they could fire two to three as many more times volley as the British could. And then they would put the men up in the fighting tops and the sharpshooters would pick away around the British guns on the ships to keep them away. Constitution never lost an engagement. She won 36 engagements. Usually two to three vessels would strike their colors to Constitution. Now you see, young America, we configured what we call super frigates. We took the best of what the British had in design and took the best of what the uh, French had in design and we built super frigates. These ships were well sailed, well manned, and they were made of live oak. The Battle of the Guerriere, a gallant British frigate, HMS Guerriere and Constitution engaged with their carronades. Now Constitution has 26 24 pound carronades. That means that Constitution is firing a 24 pound ball. These guns and these engagements would typically be very short range to the point where they're 100 yards, 50 yards, and then eventually get rail to rail, swashbuckling swords, jumping rail to rail, and overtaking the other vessel unless they had struck their colors first. Constitution in the engagement of the Guerriere was uh, termed old iron size as one of the crew members leaned over the rail and had said, huzzah, she's made of iron. The balls are bouncing off her side. Unbelievable. Constitution's carronades were firing right through the uh, British frigate and in, in Demian, uh, in, excuse me, Guerriere, as Guerriere was built of white oak and other oaks, nowhere near as strong as the live oak. These balls, if they didn't go through, it was the splintering that would kill all the men down below. The ball would impact and the wood would just splinter and shatter. And that's what would do tremendous devastation below decks. At the conclusion of the engagement with Guerriere, after half an hour when she struck her colors, they found 12 24 pound cannonballs embedded in the live oak of USS Constitution. Truly a remarkable feat. Guerriere was sailed into port under, under uh, total rig of American command and the um, Constitution went on to seek other prizes. As we get closer to the War of 1812, 1812 is USS Constitution's war. This is where she shines. This is where she helps young America under a very deprived uh, country of primarily agriculture with very limited export. Constitution is now sailing the high seas, but she's got to be well-timed. The British were beginning to blockade America. 
as they blockade our ports coming in, they would set up a ship of the line in the Chesapeake, off of Philadelphia, Boston Harbor, New York Harbor, Washington, up around Philadelphia. These blockades would own the horizon with their long guns. Nothing comes in and nothing gets out. Occasionally a heavy bribe would get something out, but it was under too many eyes that did, rarely did that happen. And you know, our little Nantucket is also under blockade. The HMS Shabigo is sailing across the court of the bay back and forth. Did you know that the British regulars are also landed in ashore? We'll talk about them in a second. The British blockade of the HMS Shabigo was no, allowing nothing in. There wasn't any food, there wasn't any um, firewood. All the men are gone on whaling voyages. They've been gone 1810, 1811. They don't even know a war is going on. Our Nantucket ships are being burned and scuttled in the Pacific, not even aware of what a war is. Remember, the British are our biggest consumers of oil products. Why buy it if we can take it? Madison declares war for three reasons. Impressment of the American sailor to the Royal Navy, dual taxation without representation, and no free trade in sailors' rights. Madison knows that this is not gonna be a territorial war. This is a war against commerce. We need to get Britain outside of our tyranny. Get this tyranny off our shores. Next, please. Madison knows he needs some help. He's got a Navy. He's got 17 ships, six frigates. It's not enough to take on the Royal Navy's 750 ships. So Madison, through letter of mark and reprisal, issues these letters of mark reprisal is a license. This is a letter of mark reprisal issued to the schooner Lynx in 1812 to the owners of Lynx. This document cost the owners of Lynx $34,000 to obtain. This is the document, my friends, that says you are not a pirate. Everybody punished pirates. Pirates were punishable by death. With a letter of mark and reprisal, you are now protected as a federally flagged vessel, protected by the US Navy, and you are now able to ply the, shore, the high seas all across the world for British cargo. We are gentlemen sailors. We are leaving the British merchant men their own possessions on the ship. We are only gonna take what the Crown is, in, is uh, getting to use against us. These ships, these privateers, Madison's Navy, Madison is the first one to get to use America's Navy. The privateers have three slang names. They're a privateer, almost. They're a blockade runner, almost. And they are um, merchant vessel takers, Baltimore Clippers. Baltimore Clippers, because primarily the Baltimore built the fastest topsail schooners and they got that name there. So we're gonna run the blockade. So we're gonna name them blockade runner. We're gonna load up with goods and we're gonna sail for Bordeaux. We're gonna sail under the darkest nights, the foggiest days, the rainiest nights and showers. We're gonna use limited visibility to run that blockade. Next, please. Here's an example of Lynx compared to a French frigate, Les Mion. This is 100 miles offshore going into Castine, Maine. And Le Mion is a 32-gun ship. She would be an equal force to USS Constitution. And you can see that we are outmanned, we are outgunned, we are small, we do not carry the armaments they do. So our engagement is not against the British Royal Navy. Lynx's engagement is against the merchant fleet that is allowing the crown to grow and to develop and to take commerce away from America apply heavy taxation on us, unrecognizing our United States. You see, by the time the war gets, Lynx flies the 15 star, 15 stripe banner. At 1812, there's actually 16 states. By the end, by the end of the war, 1815, we have 18 states. The flag had not caught up with it yet. England did not recognize the United States as a whole. What England was looking to do was to separate and divide through chaos 
and um, depriving certain states. So they would get the states picking on each other and England would come in, clean up this United States thing, go back to an English colony and that's what they uh, desired. Young America did not let that happen. We stayed united and it wasn't a united um, uh, uh, comfort with declaring war in 1812 with all the states, but we did remain united. As we sail for Bordeaux, uh, we've run the blockade. When we get to Bordeaux, France, we're going to do one of two things. We're going to put the munitions on board and the men and head up into the English Channel and raid as a privateer, or we're going to put on French goods and run the blockade back into our commerce ports. You see, the French and the English, they didn't have the type of ships we have. We have fore and aft pulling sails. We can pull our sails forward. You can see this French frigate, Le Mion. She is a square sail. They would have to use wind at the particular angles to really take advantage of getting anywhere. It might take them two weeks to get up the Chesapeake Bay, but the clever, craft, clever crafty, exceptional young Americans created these boats so that we could have commerce in our very convoluted coastline. All of our trading ports up the end of harbors, at the end of rivers, in bays, up at the top of a long bay like Chesapeake. So we could tack and sail upwind. Lloyds of London essentially stifled British com commerce ships from advancing in ship design for quite some time. As you get into the War of 1812, England comes in and they burn down Washington and they marching on to um, uh, Baltimore. Next, please. In Baltimore, they run into a speed bump. And here's a reddition from the ramparts red glare and the bombs burst in air. Here is the British bombardment of Fort McHenry in 1814. Now, Constitution is winning all of her engagements. This is another total humiliation for the British that they actually had to capitulate from this engagement. Francis Scott Key wrote that song about this. And the unique thing about that is when you sail into Baltimore Harbor, there is a buoy there and it's called the Key Buoy. The British command ship had Francis Scott Key as he was trying to negotiate the release of a sailor. The British command had Francis Scott Key there to humiliate him, to watch the bombardment, to see America fall. And it didn't happen. My friends, the reason that the British were marching on Baltimore was to burn down the very yards that build the ships, the privateers. British couldn't catch them. They didn't know what they were all about. They didn't understand our technology. And the Americans, Thomas Kemp, who built the original Lynx in 1812, he never wrote anything down. They were all built from their heads. So to, the English were headed there to burn them down at the root of their creation. Now back on Nantucket, next please. Back on Nantucket, the whalers have voyaged and here we have the tip of Great Point. As Lynx is rounding Great Point, this would be the last scene of the whalers that would head to the hunting grounds into the Pacific and up to the ice. This is a farewell to Nantucket to the whalers. You know, in 1814, there were 13 Nantucket whale ships in confiscation in Valparaiso, Chile. Valparaiso was a hotbed of English activity coming in and out of the Pacific. And these fully laden whalers were on their way back to Nantucket, most not even realizing there was a war. They were taken in Valparaiso. We have an, English, we have an American diplomat down there in Valparaiso, and he's down there trying to do what Ben Franklin did. Ben Franklin, son of a Baya uh, uh, Folger Franklin of Nantucket, uh, Benjamin, was unsuccessful in France negotiating man-for-man man release from the English Royal Navy. This gentleman, our diplomat down in Valparaiso, and under a very weak moment of British command, negotiates the release of 2,000 whalemen from Nantucket, Edgartown, Brewster, Sag Harbor, New Bedford. 13 fully laden whalers are released this guy, under cover of his hobby as a botanist, next please, under cover as a botanist, is Mr. Poinsett. Mr. Poinsett 
negotiated the release of 2,000 whalemen who would have absolutely been uh, dead from their 2,000 mile uh, death march to Lima, Peru. Poinsett, as a botanist, probably earned a higher regard for what he did and was named, was uh, uh, awarded the poinsettia plant. So next time, next Christmas, my friends, when you're setting out those poinsettia plants, remember the Nantucket whalemen and the War of 1812. Let's go on to the next, please. So my friends, this, my friends, Robert and Harvey Young recognized this house. Many of you will say, well, where is that on Nantucket? Well, it's right next to Black Eyed Susan's. So when you're standing there on India Street, trying to get into Black Eyed Susan's for breakfast or lunch, walk across the street and look at this wonderful home. This is a home that the British regulars occupied uh, while harassing people during the War of 1812 in Nantucket. Remember, we got the HMS Shabigo under blockade, nothing coming in, nothing going out. Our men are up in the ice in the Pacific. So the British regulars, a small force, but they are there definitely harassing everybody and making the town feel very uneasy. You know, William Roach, he proclaimed neutrality with Nantucket. He actually took what he thought were all the weapons on the island, the bayonets, he took them out into Nantucket Sound and proclaimed Nantucket is a neutral state, neutral place. England stay out, America stay out, we're neutral, just let us go on with our commerce. It fell on deaf ears, it didn't work. And the Roach family had to suffer through what every other Nantucketer had to do as well. This house is right around the corner from Petticoat Row. They called it Petticoat Row on Center Street because that's where all the women ran the business as the men were at sea. See, Nantucketers were very fastidious in their businesses and the women ran it and the men brought in the goods and left on Nantucket were indigent men, young children, and the young boys who would not want to get impressed into the Royal Navy on Nantucket, well, they were dug in up at the hidden forest in Pulpus. This is getting to be leading up to a very difficult time. Fort McHenry has fallen to the Americans. Constitution is winning. And now we're gonna focus on October 11th, 1814. As we get closer, we're gonna focus in on the Prince de Neuf Chatel. She's the most successful privateer on the high seas. The Prince de Neuf Chatel is captained by Julius Ordno, an ornery, arrogant, exceptionally good sailor, very tough fighter, short man. He could outwork his men and he never ever swore. He did vow to never be taken alive by the British. Ordno has been plying the seas as a privateer. Ordno, along with his letter of mark and reprisal, is getting ready to retire. These letters of mark that the government was selling for $34,000 to Lynx allowed them to fund the war up front. Ordno is responsible for taking $6.4 million worth of goods off the high seas himself. As Ordno is coming up under Block Island, up under Martha's Vineyard, gets below the vineyard and makes way for Nantucket. His goal is to use the Nantucket Shoals as safety net to get along Nantucket, to get up along the Cape, to get to Boston and retire. Ordno has got the merchant vessel Douglas with him. Teak, mahogany, molasses, uh, cotton, and rum are aboard things that Nantucket hasn't seen before in years under the British blockade. Ordno is coming up under the vineyard and he needs some help with the Nantucket Shoals. He needs pilotage. He finds two young Nantucket fish. The Hilburn brothers lived on Main Street. They agree to pilot him to Boston for $60. The boys grab their gear, they beach their gear at Surfside, and Egan Maritime Institute has wonderful images from the Rodney Sharman collection at the police station now that you can go in and see. And there's a wonderful image that Mr. Sharman did of the boys in a gig going out to the two boats standing just offshore of Surfside Beach. If you can imagine these magnificent ships within hundreds of yards of Surfside. Or no, a fastidious, um, uh, maritime captain had a lookout above and the lookout spots the billowing white sails of the HMS Endemion. 
<laughs> the HMS Endemion is a British frigate that is sailing up to the shores. Now, Ordno says, knows they won't come in because of the shoals, but he knows they're not going to go away. Every British commander knows that the Endemion has got 100, pardon me, that the Prince de Neufchatel has got 170 crew members. The Endemion has got 550 crew members coming off her uh, blockade post in New York City on her way to Halifax, well rested, watered, and fed. Ordno gets concerned. They signal the Douglas to go around to the Eastern Shore, beach the boat at low sanctity, take the boat and share the goods with the Nantucketers. 200 horse carts, three days to unload that merchant vessel. Ordno brings the Prince de Neufchatel in tighter. He slides it up under Nobadir, gets past Nobadir, gets up to the uh, Tom Never's head. And at Tom Never's head, he runs out of wind. Meanwhile, the Endeavor, the Endemian is carrying in a fair breeze. It's a breeze that the uh, Prince de Neuchâtel does not have. Ordno's concern is the Endemian's long guns. He knows they won't come in, but he knows they're not going to go away. Ordno orders his men to prepare the ship for battle. They build battle stations every 10 feet. They grease the hull down with fish products, oily, make it difficult, make it slippery. They trice up nets fore and aft, make it hard for the British to come in. And he stands his men down. Next, please. <clears throat> this engagement lasts a half an hour. Ordno at 8 p.m. Here's the grapple come up. And it leads us to this very dramatic setting. On October 11th, 1814, the hardest fought naval engagement of the entire war took place off of Nantucket between the privateer Prince de Neufchatel and five barges from the British frigate Endemion. When the captain, when the British, when the British border succeeded in gaining the forecastle of the privateer, her captain swept them overboard with a hail of canister shot and bags of musket balls fired across the main deck from one of her main guns. Again, the British suffered losses of a hundred or more to the British, to the Americans, nine killed and 19 wounded. Remember, we know that the Prince de Neuchâtel is 170 crew. Ordno does not. Ordno has got 38 prisoners down below, and he's got 36 men on deck, including Charles Hilburn, the pilot from Nantucket. Ordno knows the British are there. He sends up a rocket. The rocket illuminates. He sees what the odds are. There are terrible odds. There are five barges attached to the privateer. There are 150 Royal Marine trained fighters. Ordno's crew sees this. We didn't sign up for this. We're gentlemen sailors. He grabs a lit torch as he sees them in their retreat. He holds it over the powder magazine. He says, if you don't stop your retreat, I'll blow the ship up now. We'll all be gone, but I'm not giving in to the British. I'm a dead man. Captain Ordno's men of 36 now become more afraid of their captain than they are of 150 Royal Marine trained fighters that are ready to go for it. And now it goes. Here is an image firing at the moment, 200 years to the moment. October 11th, 2014, we sent a volley of 30 firings, one volley for every moment that the battle ensued. At the end of a half an hour, the British second in command capitulates and the battle is over. Within a month and a half of this engagement, Fort McHenry falling, the Constitution winning, England trying to repel, take over Napoleon and France. They're running out of resources. They're running out of everything they need. England capitulates in the War of 1812. And now we have our sovereign nation. We have one Nantucket casualty in this battle. We have, the battle was fought with 36 men and young Charles Hilburn has given his life off the Nantucket Southeast Quarter at Tom Never's Head. These were gallant men that fought gallantly. The British commander on the Endemion said he never realized the determination of American fighters. And they said they, he said that they fought as gallant as anything he had ever seen. Next, please. 
So here we are, my friends. We are now a free and independent nation. We are a nation that is recognized by our flag. We are a nation that is 18 states, and now we're gonna to begin to discover more. I think you've got something for us, Bill. I do indeed. We've come full circle now from that first song. We have another song that grabbed the imagination of this land of ours as quickly as that other one did. In fact, even faster. Oh, the spirit ever, where free men shall stand between their loved homes and the war's desolation, blessed with victory and peace. May the heavens rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just and thus be our motto in God is our trust. Then the star spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Well, my friends, now what do we have? We have a free and independent nation. Next, please. Free and independent nation. We no longer need these small little privateers. They're too fast to regulate. They're uh, too small to carry much cargo. And here's a beautiful shot of the schooner Lynx under Captain Alex Peacock's command coming out of Boston. So what we're gonna do with this fleet is we're gonna turn them into the revenue fleet and they're gonna do the taxation on our coastline. The revenue fleet is gonna lead into another thing that we all know so well. And the first revenue cutter force of the privateers in 1815 eventually will turn into the United States Coast Guard. We have free trade, we have sailors' rights, we got rid of dual taxation without representation, we have uh, no longer uh, the tyranny underneath the English um, throat, boot on our throat. And what do we have, my friends? We have just ended the Revolutionary War as we've ended the War of 1812. Next, please. We usher in a whole new era. And here is Mr. Sanford. Mr. Sanford's home was where the town and country house is on Federal Street in Nantucket. Mr. Sanford was a uh, clipper ship merchant. And you can see those two clipper ships. So we've ushered in the greyhounds of the sea to take up on the China tea trade, the, in the uh, India tea trade, and vessels crossing the oceans open seas, open commerce for everybody to enjoy. And a young America now can begin to discover what's west of the Mississippi. We're gonna now usher in a whole new era and Bill's got a fabulous uh, exit to this uh, period. And Bill, why don't you go in? Beautiful song that this young nation of ours carried all over the globe. You could hear it echoing in the far-flung harbors of Canton, Shanghai, Durban, Calcutta, and the old ports of Europe. For back then, the unlimited scope of the horizon, the possibilities, endless, were bound up in one phrase, across the wide Missouri. Oh, Shenandoah, see you way rolling river oh Shenandoah I long to hear you way hey we're bound away across the wide Missouri Oh, Shenandoah 
I took an ocean As we begin to come to a close of this program, this history, this history plays out almost daily in Nantucket, St. Simon's Island, these two islands that have given so much to America through their resources, through their people, through their love of America. The cruise between St. Simon's and Nantucket for Lynx brings us to Annapolis, which has got our own storied history with the US Naval Academy. So come down to the harbor, come to our exhibit this summer at the NHA at the Whaling Museum. Come down, whether you can get aboard Lynx or if you're at Brand Point, to enjoy this <laughs> playing out. Our horizons are limitless. We look forward to seeing you on deck. I hope you know a little bit more about Nantucket, St. Simons, and the War of 1812 than we did a little under an hour ago. Thank you very much. I think we can all just sit back for a second and appreciate all those, the, the sounds and the, and the history coming together to tell that incredible story. So it's so nice for you to have joined us. Um, if it's all right with you, we're gonna take some questions and everyone, the Q&A is open. Um, if you have something to, to ask these guys. Um, so, uh, please get those questions into us. Um, so we have a question, um, Don, what do you mean by live oak? Live oak is a uh, species of oak that is called live oak. We have, there are many oaks. Um, traditionally for shipbuilding, white oak is preferred. Red oak is like a straw. So red oak doesn't produce a good ship. White oak is strong. It's got a closed cell structure. But live oak is a very gnarly, the wood is always moving. It's very, very difficult to work with, but it really is called live oak. And it's a, a very bush-like big tree. Great, um, thank you. Uh, so we have a message from John Rice to Bill. He says, hello, Bill, John. Uh, we served together on Shenandoah in the early 70s. Me as a lowly crew, you as a shanty man. Remember coming into Mystic Seaport with you, leading the whole crew in song. So does the oh, nice I, I, I remember that very, very well. That was, in fact, when we, uh, uh, I was able to teach the crew the true value of a shanty when they realized that they could carry the shanties from the foxhole and actually from the forbits up where the uh, windlass is uh, into the local bars. And if they sang them there, they would look up at the bar in front of them and they would find four or five glasses of drinks that were given to them by the people in the uh, restaurant. <laughs> wow. Shanties can be valuable. <laughs> Thank you for that. And uh, uh, we have a comment uh, who's somebody's dad was on the Shenandoah as well. So uh, <laughs> um, we have a few like that. <laughs> We do have a question from Richard who asks, um, did the Canadians side with the Brits? Uh, yeah, the Canadians did side with the Brits. Um, it was, uh, uh, and, a, and a lot of, of American were um, siding with the Brits as well. Uh, the battles of, Lake, uh, battles of Lake Erie and across the skirmishes were really quite intense. Lake Champlain played a big part in that. So um, we were not, well, a couple of times they said we were in territorial gain for Canada, but that wasn't our aim. That's just where the battles happened. And um, it was interesting. They would build boats on the ice and you better have your boat built by ice out. Great. Um, Bill, we have a question for you. Uh, what do you think about the Sea Shanty Revival? I think it's great. <laughs> it was, it, it's way beyond my technical capabilities, 
but uh, we're actually talking about because we we use Shenandoah uh, on Shenandoah the vessel uh, to raise uh, well it, it's almost a thousand pound anchor uh, up off the bottom and we're thinking of doing one of those with Shenandoah because people don't realize that it's also a work song. Oh, Shenandoah, I long to hear you. Got it. Oh, hey, hey, you roll, whoop, you roll in the river, etc., cetera, et cetera. So my dog is okay, too. All right. So, yeah, yeah, I love it. And I think we're going to try to do one ourselves. And boy, oh boy, that that one thing that that long John, uh, what is it? Uh, the long uh, lever, Johnny lever. Uh, my God, from all over the world, everybody's coming in. Beautiful, what fun! Yeah, it's so great to for these these songs to get um, appreciated by a new generation. So it's nice to have these songs appreciated by a new generation. I'm, I'm <laughs> using you. Uh, and speaking of sea shanties, Bill, um, which has been your favorite over the years? Probably Shenandoah. Although, you know, you, you switch off because you keep finding gorgeous songs. I, I tend more towards the, uh, the beautiful ballads, uh, which are still work songs and do have a reason for being on vessels for what, what is going on. But uh, I, oh, I, I also think of... Uh, uh, Franklin, Lady Franklin's Lament. Some people may know it because Bob Dylan took it over and changed the words to it and called it a train going west. But uh, it actually is a shanty wailing uh, from the early 1840s. Or mid, I'm sorry, no, late 1840s. Yeah. Was that an answer? Sorry. That's great. That's great. <laughs> um, we have a question. Um, Someone would like to uh, have you please discuss how, how many Nantucket whalemen uh, were eventually returned to the island after their whaling ships were captured by the British warships. So it's a good question. Uh, the history that we have on this, I'm grateful for Jack Warner from in, Scott, in uh, Tom Never's Head to put the book together, Tom Never's Ghost, where we pull the history a lot of presidents and people wrote about this, this history of the Battle of Nantucket specifically and the War of 1812, but they did it 80 or 90 years post-war. The, the history that we got was eight days after the war from Providence, and Jack did all that research. It was said that of the 13 whalers that were in Valparaiso, that nine of those whale ships returned to Nantucket fully laden. As far as the details of that, I can't tell you. But uh, that's, what, that's, what they, that's what the document said, that Point Set got those 13 out and nine returned fully laden. Some may have gone to New Bedford. Great. Um, were the, worship, the, the warships built uh, here on Nantucket or elsewhere, elsewhere and then sailed to the island? So um, there were a couple of ships built on Nantucket out of Brand Point. But for example, the uh, whaling ship Essex they suspect that the Essex was originally built as a merchant ship. She was launched in Amesbury, Massachusetts, ironically from the era, area that Coffin and Macy and those guys hailed from. So um, uh, the warships were not built on Nantucket. Primarily, most of the ships were built in the Chesapeake and in and around Boston, but they would find themselves for sale like privateers in Boston and New York. Great. Um, someone wanted a clarification question. Uh, what, what were you speaking about when you said the boys went and hid in pulpits? Yeah, so, um, you know, the very young boys that after their fathers had left on the whaling voyages in 1810, 11, uh, 9, that were up in the ice, that were too young to go on a voyage, uh, even too young to be powder monkeys, uh, they, um, as they grew, they were subject to British impressment you know, the British regulars living in the Young's house on India Street, uh, they, um, you know, they were a marauding, a marauding group of people. And as these boys grew, they had to hide. So they dug themselves in up in the hidden forest to hide from British impressment. It's a fantastic story. And I, I hadn't heard that either. So yeah. um, is there any more detail on why Lloyd's of London would insure schooner rigs? Well, uh, 
we, we have it that the British car, the British, of course, you know, when Madison declared war on England, they had 750 naval ships. So they were not new to shipbuilding, nor were they new to commerce all over the high seas. I, I think Lloyd's of London looked at it that our cargo gets to where it's always going to get to, it gets there safe, and they weren't going to go out of the box and ensure things differently. You know, the original links built in 1812 was captured by the British in 1813 on the Rappahannock River. She was considered the finest privateer that they had seen. And because they didn't understand why we're so low, why we're so maneuverable, why we go up wind so well, they actually took the links to England and they took her apart and drew her out. So they finally began to understand. As late as Nathaniel Philbrick's book, The Sea of Glory, uh, where he actually featured my great great grandfather, Nat writes in there a British, uh, an American quote that the the eyes of the British will see fondly upon the schooners, and that was as late as 1838, 1840. So the schooner rig was still somewhat new to British. They were there were a lot of schooners built in in Bermuda and a lot of schooners built in Cuba, but there weren't many being built over in England. Yeah, the, the, the secret technology of the American um, warship and whale fleet is just um, such an incredible part of this whole thing. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, so we have some more well wishes, and I just wanted to call out one before we close up for tonight. Uh, it's from Anne, who says, I just want to thank you both for this very interesting presentation. Wonderful to hear Bill's singing again. My husband, Tom, and I brought Bill to Baltimore on many occasions, including a performance at Fort, uh, Fort McHenry and the World Series. But Bill, hope to see you and see and hear from you again on Nantucket this summer from Anne. Oh, I so, hope so too. I hope so. <laughs> I am. <laughs> oh boy. I think we're all excited to see uh, friends and family again. Uh, oh, coming. yes, yes. And that was, in fact, singing the Star Spangled Banner under the Star Spangled Banner. Can ask for more. <laughs> so with that, um, I just want to thank uh, uh, Don and Bill. Uh, and I want to thank everyone here uh, who has joined us for tonight. Uh, media, media sponsorship for this evening's event is generously provided by Novation Media. Uh, please join us on April 6th for our next NHA University featuring Noel Wilson. Uh, Wilson will be discussing the Western whale, Whalers in 1860s Hogatate, uh, how the Nantucket of the North Pacific linked Japan to the world. Programs such as this are made possible thanks to the support of our members. If you are not a member, please consider joining by heading to nha.org membership. Thank you all for joining us.